This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, the playbook, and talk about the epitome of an entrepreneur. I have a friend of mine, someone that I look up to because he has tested time and been successful through all the different ups and downs as an entrepreneur. Matt Higgins, CEO of RSC Ventures, an entrepreneur, an executive fellow at Harvard Business School. Even though I don't think the guy went to college, it's incredible what you can do as an entrepreneur. Anyway, welcome, Matt Higgins. Uh, thanks for having me, Dave. I did go to college, by the way. I dropped, I, out of, I dropped out of high school. It's funny you said that. Whenever anybody puts in a bio, sometimes they forget that part. I'm like, it doesn't quite add up if you don't tell the rest of it. I went to college. I went to law school, but yeah, but I did drop. Yeah, what, exactly. Dropped out. And the, the thing in most common denominator uh, <clears throat> of all entrepreneurs, though, is the desire that you must be what you can be, regardless of the circumstances where we start and regardless of what happens in the middle. Um, and you have an upcoming book that kind of uh, talks about uh, different plans in life and you got to utilize those plans, but you named it Burn the Boats. Toss plan B overboard and unleash your full potential. What do you think the common denominator is of people who carry this spirit of excellence uh, in this idea of burning the boats? What's the common denominator of reaching our full potential? Great. Um, by the way, here's the book. Thank you. Burn the Boats. It's actually out now. Thank you. I love the cover. Worked a long time on it. Um, so why, bur <clears throat> why burn the boats? <clears throat> I've, um, I've been obsessed with this uh, phrase that shows up since the beginning of recorded history in different languages. Every culture on earth, I would argue, has the similar fable where there's a military general who is outnumbered 101. And when their backup was against the wall, they took the most contrarian move possible, which is they eliminated their escape route, they burned the boats, and oftentimes they eliminated their food supplies that wouldn't last them, uh, in the case of one um, Chinese fable, uh, three days, right? So this is a recurring fact pattern of <clears throat> when your back is against the wall, the best way to be effective is to eliminate your retreat. And I kept encountering this even when I saw Rex Ryan go to the playoffs uh, when I ran the uh, business of the Jets we were against the Steelers and he gave this like fiery speech to the players about how you know uh, you know Cortez who's a bad guy don't emulate him but Cortez burned the boats you know all I'm asking you to do is give me one game you know one half or you know wh whatever it was and and there was an article in the Times about how it it flipped a switch in the players and they gave an extra level of effort. And a lot of the players cited that particular speech of giving them permission to even dig, dig deeper. So I started thinking, is it, does it still hold true? Does this idea that the best way that humans perform and can have breakthrough success is by, you know, burning the boats. And I interviewed 50 different athletes, billionaires, celebrities, artists, coaches, and then surveyed my own journey and realized every single one of us before we achieve breakout success had to overcome a metaphorical boat. The thing that's holding us back before we can go forward. In my case, it's what we just talked about when we started. It was the shame of my childhood. It was growing up in squalor and it was being a high school dropout and ultimately failing and saving my mother. I had all these legacy issues that, was, that were making me feel um, not worthy or not wanting to be scrutinized. And that was the boat I needed to burn. So my book is for all those people out there who are looking to break out and they know that they have, the universe has something more in store for them, but these internal and external obstacles keep holding them back. And as we have what I call this quantum energetic and genetic inheritance that limits our potential. And a lot of those limitations come from, as you stated, this meaning of the past. We all have defining moments, inflection points, and we even give extra energy to historical references. I always joke around. I spoke at a sports world summit in France. And this one woman came up to me and said, but remember the American French war and like was using the American French war to limit some sort of potential of an opportunity because of some historical reference. How best in your book do you illustrate how we change the mindset because, you know, as Viktor Frankl wrote in Man's Search for Meaning, it's really about the meaning that we're giving, the fact, the fact that we had a single mom that was broke and we dropped out of high school. And yet you're teaching the smartest academic people in the world at Harvard Business School, our future business leaders. How much can we control the meaning 
of these inflection points or defining moments. Yeah, I mean the mean the meaning is everything. And I, 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 if 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 somebody doesn't want to believe that anything is truly possible in this world, and that the die is cast, or that the deck is stacked against them, my book won't resonate. Right? Like you you have to first believe that the universe is wired to allow anything to happen and i and i do believe that so so you begin there and then the historical references the fact that this sort of idea repeats all the way from the beginning of time is a degree of authority right there's a reason why it keep re, it keeps uh, repeating and so you know my my first task is to use authority of both the past but also psychology and science to prove to you that you will perform better without a safety net and a plan B. And when I say those words, we're like, way bad. I have rent to pay. I got mouths to feed. You don't know what it's like. Well, that's why I tell the story of growing up utterly poor and destitute because I do know what it's like, right? Number number one. But two, there's a great study out of Wharton uh, in 2014. And they wanted to try to measure both the, uh, the impact of having a plan B, um, not having one, just contemplating it, on intrinsic motivation to succeed and at the same time likelihood to succeed. And what they did, it had two groups of, of students and they allowed one group to go ahead and just simply think about another way to complete the exercise. And two interesting findings. One, not only were they statistically less likely to actually succeed, they just weren't as interested anymore. So the first job I have is to convince everyone listening right now, trust me, the energy leakage you devote to plan B is materially affecting whether you're ever gonna get to plan A. Okay, now you admit that into evidence. What do you do? What are the things, what are the metaphorical boats that we all have to deal with? So on my cover, if you see, and I worked really hard on this, mattered a lot to me. This is meant to be a, a paper boat floating in a child's tub because so many of the issues that we have do stem from childhood. And by the way, if you're one of the people that grew up in a perfect non-dysfunctional family, God bless you. I wish you could adopt me as a child. But for the yeah. rest of us out there, the vast majority who have legacy childhood issues, it begins by by um, auditing yourself. Why is that important? Because a lot of the metaphorical boats we need to burn prevent us from wanting to be scrutinized because we're carrying something. We don't want to be looked at. And when you don't want to, when you don't want to be looked at, you don't want to look within as well. Self-awareness is the greatest sort of is the greatest unlock. So the book lays out, I believe, um, a blueprint built upon a case. The case is you will perform better without the safety net. The blueprint is how do I identify the internal obstacles? that prevent me from uh, going all in, imposter syndrome, shame? And how do I identify the external obstacles, which are harder to put your finger on, the corporate saboteur who is trying to withhold praise to keep you destabilized? And at the end, hopefully when you finish the journey of this book, you'll begin to believe, you know what? Anything is possible. Hey, Matt did it. And these 50 other people did it. I, I can do it too. And you are a beacon for that. And what's so interesting is, I think there's a nuance when we talk about only having a plan A, that a lot of people don't understand. And it's the same nuance where they attach their emotions to an outcome by only having a plan A. I think there has to be an element, uh, which you only, I think, can learn through maturity of what I call radical humility or ignorant humility, that there comes a point in your life where you realize, I don't know what I don't know. Uh, and I'm not gonna utilize fear to pretend like I know what I know, but I will, and for me, I believe in only having a plan A for today uh, in a trajectory towards where I think I wanna be in the future. But my plan A isn't attaching my emotions to an outcome, it's attaching my emotions to today. And whether you study the Bhagavad Gita of daily practices, the Course in Miracles of daily practices, Napoleon Hill or Carnegie, who all completely rely on daily practices of plan A today in a trajectory to where you wanna be in the future, it's counterintuitive to not attach your emotions to winning the Super Bowl. It's very difficult to say, uh, we have to win the game today and in a trajectory of winning the Super Bowl, but I'm not gonna be happy when I win the Super Bowl, I'm gonna be happy when I perform my best today, do my best, learn lessons and have fun today. How much do you believe that we can have a plan A for today and still be open-minded to change plan A because the pandemic is tomorrow and plan A just definitely doesn't work? Oh, um, love these questions. Uh, number one, the, the overarching theme of the book is that the joy of living is in the striving, not the winning, right? I mean, anybody who has 
ran a marathon or Olympians report this, there's tons of studies, understands that the post-marathon blues or the melancholy that you know visits anyone. It's because what we seek in life is to pursue the ceiling on our potential where it's an act of discovery. What am I meant to do here? What am I capable of doing here? And that's where the real joy comes in that sort of struggle and the striving, which, um, so number one, the book is a blueprint for a life of perpetual pursuit. There's a great line from Jeff uh, Bezos that he says, you need to be uh, rigid in your vision and flexible in, in your execution. So I 100% agree with you that the overarching goal is to move in the general direction of your ambition, but to have you know flexibility in how that plays out. But I would argue that plan A encompasses the versatility or the adaptability. It doesn't mean like it's just got to be this. My favorite reaction to the book, which is deliberate, by the way, the book is meant to provoke, in some cases, a violent, visceral reaction of rejection. Burn the boats. That sounds, you know, like I said before, irresponsible. People say, well, you know, what about the risk? I am the most paranoid risk taker you're ever going to meet. What I argue is for a process for synthesizing risk. And what I mean by that is that you need to imagine at the beginning of the journey, what is the worst case scenario if this doesn't go well? And the reason why that's so important is when you ask yourself those questions, you realize you could pretty much weather almost anything. And by the way, the goal that you're about to pursue, you would endure almost any pain in order to achieve it. If you go, what I find when people end up wavering uh, about plan A and they, they revisit things is because they were afraid to ask the question at the beginning, what's the worst that could happen? And the reason why they're afraid, they don't want to, they want to get rejected. They're worried that if I ask myself that question, I'm going to find that the pain is intolerable. And the answer is the pain is never intolerable. For me, my, my, my shorthand uh, execution around this idea is I revisit things all the time, whatever my, even this book, why did I write the book? Oh, wait a minute. I already did that. But by, by asking the hard questions in the beginning about how much risk can you tolerate when your mind plays tricks on you and when you're taking incoming from whatever direction, internal or an external, you'll remember that you already went through the exercise, asked and answered, as they say in the law, right? Like I already, I already, I already took care of that. That's what I argue in the book. So my plan A, my burn the boats move. Uh, synthesizes the risk at the inception of the journey so that I can peacefully, fearlessly move forward, remembering that I already went through the exercise. So anyone out here listening, thinking that I'm advocating, you know, not paying your bills, not paying, no, I am so paranoid. And I built in downside protection into everything I do, but then I move in one direction and that's forward. Yeah. If you do a timing and risk tolerance assessment before you enter in, you're always going to be satisfied. Even if the outcome, you know, when I buy a lottery ticket and do a timing and risk tolerance assessment and Saturday at 8 p.m., I knew I had a billion billion to one chance to win a half a billion dollars and I lose two bucks. I'm still happy because right. it was aligned with, with that. Now, we, we talked about how to be successful, how to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential. And, and truly, there's so many studies out there. I encourage you not only to read Burn the, Bo the Boats, but also to look at how we you know, enjoy the pursuit of our potential, but there's also control and, you know, understanding we have control of our mindset, our heart set and our handset. We have no control and change. Only people who like change are wet babies anyway, but you talk and take an interesting approach to accountability. And it seems like to me, there's three stages in your book about accountability. One was responsibility, which I think is most common. You know, I'm going to be responsible for my actions and thoughts, et cetera. One is more attraction, right? What did I do to attract this to myself? What am I supposed to learn from it? But there was an interesting aspect that I really analyzed in the book about accountability is was what am I doing to participate in this perception? You know, and I kind of rang in my mind. It was like, hey, what you think about what I'm doing is none of my business. You know, <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to participate in some perception of accountability that's not aligned uh, with the activities of what I do say, think, believe, and feel. How important is accountability and control? And are there any variances to what I perceive to be very valuable lessons in the book about accountability? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I think um, a lot of people spend unnecessary energy lobbying for buy-in uh when they don't need it you know at the, when you are on the bleeding edge of bleeding edge of innovation and you are op acting on opportunity before the tipping point of evidence right and that's when oppor real opportunities 
uh, are, are actually disproportionately correlated to evidence of the opportunity. It makes sense, right? Because if it was an opportunity that everybody could see and the data would prove, everybody would be doing it. So what I argue in the book is that all that energy you're spending on trying to create buy-in is really just a reflection of your own security uh, insecurity often, right? Because we want validation. And that's the worst thing you could do when you're pursuing game break, you know, breakthrough innovation because you won't find it out there. So what, what I argue in the book is just make sure that the, uh, the energy you're spending trying to bring people along and lobbying them is direct, directly related to your objectives, right? Why am I trying to get my colleagues to go ahead and agree if at this moment in time, there's too much of a gap between my intuition and the data, it's too high of an expectation to expect anybody to see what I see because I had a, an epiphany at 3 a.m. in the morning. So I just, I'm talking about this from personal experience. Some of my biggest regrets where I don't respect myself, and this happens a lot, like this isn't like an ongoing thing, is when I look at all the energy I spent worrying about what people thought of me or not even so much of me, I don't really care that much about that, what people thought of what I was advocating or what I was saying or what I was thinking, when in the end of the day, I didn't really need them to agree with me. Like it was irrelevant. So it sounds a little mercenary, but it's true. Like you got to ask yourself constantly, like, why am I trying to bring everybody along? Because you have to respect the fact that people are busy and they can't see into your brain and see your epiphanies. And so that's what I generally mean by rejecting a degree of accountability and at the, at the nascent phase. It's amazing, you know, as we have a segregated community and we're able to build different communities, you're one of the leaders that I look at uh, that has an eclectic background like mine, you know, top of their game in multiple places from the dolphins to restaurants to, you know, drone racing to soccer. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And when you're in uh, this realm, you Shark Tank, by the way, I didn't even mention and the other TV shows that you're producing and executive producing and starring in that will will see you uh, in, in the near future as well. Here you come in where you prioritize writing a book. And, you know, the rule of, for me, at least in writing the, the, the books that I've written, it's like, if you write a book to, to make money, don't, but you need to write a book to make money. And that is in varying uh, layers and degrees to do so. For you sitting down to write this book, what was the passion? Because you don't need the money, right? You, you don't need the notoriety. You, you d didn't need another project. So it's interesting to me that someone like you would write another book that would write this book, but there had to be some sort of passion about you You want to plant a seed or there, there has to be a purpose behind this book. What was that? It's going to sound, it's a great question. It's gonna, it is going to sound corny, but um, I have all these one-to-one -one interactions with people where I feel like I'm fighting for the underdog inside them. I'm fighting to right the wrongs of the universe. Like, uh, for example, you walk into a great coffee shop and there's a barista who is like so engaging and so into the job. And then you're like, you know, are you a son of the owner? Like, no, I just love this place. And you're like, that person should own this place, right? Like when I when I, when I I encounter magic all in the world, I, I it's like, it's almost like a drug. I'm like, I can't help but go deep into figuring out how do we right the wrong in the universe that found you here being an employee when you should be the owner? Or how do we end the subjugation that you're being subjected to every day by a cruel boss because you're a pleaser and you can't break the cycle of seeking approval like and I'm going to get really convoluted psychologically but I love to sort of be the be the um the trajectory changing intervention in someone's life it feels like I'm getting closer to God not that I am that I get to see this is what God has in store for us and the universe has in store I love doing that right problem is it doesn't scale the book is my attempt to take those one-to-one -one conversations and distill them in a way that, uh, that is engineered to reach the largest number of people possible. And I used the word engineered rather than written because if you want a book to reach people, you have to put in the time and effort to figure out what's it take to make a book successful. And so I, I put my heart and soul into this to say, what's it going to take to both resonate and to reach, right? What I find a lot of people in my position do when they've had quote unquote, you know, success is they think everyone cares and nobody, nobody cares, nor should they. So it becomes an exercise of vanity. What I tried to do with this book is put the reader at the center of the journey and imagine a marginalized individual feeling like the die was cast. And their first thing when they read and they see Matt Higgins on Shark Tank, Harvard, oh, white middle-aged guy grew up on third base. Like, I'm like, I wasn't even in the stadium. Like, forget about what base I was on. And so I share the details about me being a high school dropout, eating government cheese, 
the, the embarrassment of the situation living in a roach motel, because I want somebody to be able to meet me at that point of the journey, not at the end of the journey. And so it's a long way of saying like, I, I, I really hope that somebody out there who's on the fringes, on the margins, reads this book and is like, damn, like, all right, like you show me 50 different ways and you use your law degree to make a case that feels pretty ironclad. I tried to poke holes in it, but you obviously spent thousands of hours like a madman trying to retort everything I might say to you to reject your book. And in the end of it, you're like, I'm going to give it a shot. Like, it almost takes my breath away to think of people around the country, like reading this book and being like, I'm going to give it a shot. And the early um, responses so far, when that has happened, it feels them like the single most important thing I've ever done in my life. If I'm being honest, the money is bullshit. The professional accolades are nonsense. None of it matters. The ability to reach people and try to unlock them when I can't talk to them because it's not feasible is why I wrote the book, why I spent three years of my life killing myself to, enge to engineer this outcome. It's amazing because the impact that you have reminds me of a mentor of mine, Dennis Waitley, who was a sales mentor in San Diego years and years ago. I think he's almost 90 now, but uh, he told me he wrote books to plant seeds under trees that he ne never, ever sit under. And uh, I've been blessed to see third party uh, your accomplishments in the respect of impact, whether it be for autism uh, or for changing people's lives. I've uh, been blessed to go to restaurants that you've assisted in and to uh, teams, leagues, organizations. And it's remarkable just to confirm that your mission is being sought and proven out. And this book is just another step. Hold it up for me one second. Yeah, you thank you. And one last because... point on the writing of the book, too, for those who are out there who can't stand the redundancy of business books. I hear you. I agree with you. They tend to be written as reference manuals often. And I don't think people assimilate information like that through indexes. They assimilate through storytelling. So I tried to use, I used to be a reporter when I was a kid, wrote a lot of investigative. I, I leaned on those skills to try to make this a book that hopefully will imprint. And hopefully you say, I could read this in one sitting. Uh, and it was intentional because I wanted to defy the way these, and there's a lot of uncomfortable details in there that I cringe at when I read, but they were meant to be so that you can identify with me. Don't see me as how I ended up. See me as how I started. I love that. Planting seeds under trees. He may never sit under in all aspects of life. Make sure that you check out Burning the Boats, Toss Plan B Overboard and Unleash Your Full Potential by the incredible an amazing friend of mine, Matt Higgins. Thank you so much for joining me. You're a me. sweetheart, Dave. You know, you have a big heart. Thank you for having me on. I do appreciate it. Anytime. I'm uh, ordering these for all my friends and family as well. Mm -hmm.